Welcome back at the technical forum at the group exhibit Hydrogen, Fuel Cells and Batteries. We are here at the Hanover Fair in the year of 2016. This year we celebrate a very special year. We are celebrating the partnership with the United States of America. This is indeed also a very interesting presentation. We are here and we have a representative of the US Department of Energy. We will hear a discussion on the, uh, the presentation on the U.S. Department of Energy regarding the hydrogen and fuel cells. We'll hear an overview. And for that, please welcome with me on stage the program manager, Dr. Dimitrios Papagagopoulos. Big hands, please. Thank you, Mana. On behalf of the U.S. Department of Energy, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Dimitris Papadjogopoulos. I'm the program manager for fuel cells in the Fuel Cell Technologies Office, which is directed by Dr. Sunita Satyapal, who is currently in a, a participating in a different panel, but at the same time sends her regards. So I'm going to provide an overview of the activities of the Department of Energy concerning hydrogen and fuel cells, a look at the progress that we made, and also um, our outlook. So, to start off, um, I want to mention that COP21 was not just a mere photo opportunity. It's the first universal climate agreement. It's a comprehensive agreement that uh, targets the implementation of a carbon neutral society by 2050. And for that purpose, it has introduced a review process. Every five years, they're going to be reviewing, uh, updating the targets, and the move towards the clean energy uh, society. At the same time, it um, acknowledges the need to speed up our transition to that clean energy society. It also acknowledges the need that further innovation is needed and aims to support that. The Department of Energy's efforts are in um, agreement with the President's All of the Above Energy Strategy. It's a strategy that wants to utilize all energy resources available in a transition to a clean energy society in the United States. And hydrogen and fuel cells are a part of that All of the Above Energy Strategy. So why hydrogen? Hydrogen is a flexible fuel. It is involved in diverse applications. As a fuel, it's not only fuel cells, it's being used in engines and turbines, also for energy storage. At the same time, though, hydrogen is a chemical commodity and is used in various chemical processes. Petroleum recovery and refining and ammonia production are two examples of that. It is derived from natural gas through steam methane reforming, and I'm going to touch upon that topic later on in my presentation. And that is a very uh, appropriate transition fuel as we move on to the utilization of renewables, either utilizing wind and solar, for instance, through electrolysis. And at the same time, hydrogen can be derived and produced from a nuclear as well. I would like to actually share with you uh, a, the positive trend that we've been seeing in the market. There's been over a 30% annual growth since 2010 with more than 50,000 fuel cells shipped in 2014 alone. The majority of those fuel cells were shipped in Japan for station app applications, but at the same time in 2015 in the U.S. we've seen the first fuel cell electric vehicles being commercially available either through leasing for the Hyundai or on sale as is the case with the Toyota Mirai and we've been seeing other OEMs coming into the picture with um, new prototypes that have been um, hitting the auto show floors. 
the Honda Clarity is one example of that. So just to give you an overview of the hydrogen uh, fuel cells program in the Department of Energy, its mission is to enable the wide, uh, widespread commercialization of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. It has an applied R&D um, part of it, looking at research and development on hydrogen fuels, including onboard storage for automotive applications, as well as fuel cell R&D. It also includes, though, cross-cutting activities involved with the R&D for manufacturing, safety codes and standards. We have education outreach activities, as well as technology validation and market transformation. To enable the widespread commercialization of various technologies, they need to be competitive with the incumbent. And for that purpose, we have actual time-bound targets, or so 2020 targets on the uh, fuel cell and uh, fuel co um, cost are $40 per kilowatt projected at high volume. There's also, uh, uh, for the hydrogen, uh, onboard storage cost targeted at $10 per kilowatt hour, and hydrogen dispensed being at less than $4 uh, gasoline gallon equivalent. Apart from automotive, transportation applications, we're looking at stationary, and you can see the actual cost and durability targets that we have for those, looking at $1,000 per kilowatt cost when operated on uh, natural gas, and $1,500 per kilowatt when uh, biogas is utilized and a durability of 80,000 hours. The DOE activities span three areas. The first one on your left-hand side there, uh, our concern was research and development. And we can see that those have had a positive impact on how the technology has moved forward. We've been able to uh, get more than a 50% decrease in cost since 2006 for fuel cells, which was a result of a five-fold reduction in the amount of platinum used, a four-fold uh, increase in durability, which is also something that has to be um, achieved concurrently with reducing cost. With the projected volume for automotive system at high volume, high volumes uh, manufactured at half a million vehicles per year is now projected, as I mentioned, to be at $53 per kilowatt. There's also though a demonstration aspect to our program, and that is due to the fact that you may develop or help develop those technologies, but they have to be validated under real world operating conditions. And for that purpose, we have um, various projects in this area. Um, the, the main one that is renowned is our automotive fuel cell technology validation effort with more than 220 fuel cell electric vehicles on the road, six million miles traveled in 30 stations. As well, on the stationary side, we've demonstrated the, worst, the world's first tri-generation station. A third um, part of our program has to do with deployment. And when we say deployment, it concerns the cost share deployment of fuel cell systems for um, early markets. Those are markets that uh, will enable uh, further commercialization and um, the ones that have been highlighted concerned um, fuel cell forklifts and backup power for telecommunication applications. Example, for approximately 1,600 units that were um, deployed with DOE funding, we now have over 13,500 um, units being deployed without any DOE funding at all. So both forklifts and backup power have been very successful early markets in the US. So in terms of where we get the hydrogen, one thing that I mentioned at the start of my presentation is that hydrogen is a known chemical commodity. There's 10 million metric tons of hydrogen produced in the United States, mostly from steam methane reforming from natural gas. So it's not an exotic fuel, so to speak. As we move forward, we want to basically transition to getting hydrogen from renewables. But for a near-term strategy for cost-competitive hydrogen fuel, SMR is our way forward, and natural gas is a transitional fuel in that um, road. I mentioned early markets. So one of the earliest markets known for fuel cells were space applications. We've moved beyond that and um, we're looking at new markets and have been looking at new markets that would enable the reduction in the cost 
that would actually be able to facilitate a robust supply base. They would help um, emerging infrastructure and they would create that customer acceptance because that's outreach is something in education and general public regarding any technology is something that's really needed. So apart from forklifts, backup power, there are other applications that are resurfacing or surfacing such as fuel cell bus applications and fuel cell tow trucks in, at airports. It's a, quite a new one for our uh, department. So I'll touch upon a bit the aspect of hydrogen infrastructure. So one thing that is not known is that there is currently approximately 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipeline in the United States. So there is the relative infrastructure there for those um, opening stages of deploying fuel cells. As we move forward, we're looking at hydrogen that could be produced from a central site, or you can have distributed production, you know, either through natural gas or renewables, utilizing electrolysis, water electrolysis, that is. In terms of hydrogen stations in the United States, there are various states that have been looking into further developing those, deploying those stations. There has been a, a memorandum of understanding that was signed between eight states, targeting the deployment of 3.3 million zero electric emission vehicles by 2025. And also what you possibly know is the work that the state of California has been doing with the targeting and planning 100 stations, investing $100 million by 2023. And as an example of that, and a snapshot of the current status, looking at California, they have a total of 52 hydrogen stations deployed, 14 of those being uh, publicly available. We understand that hydrogen infrastructure is, a, is an issue, so for that purpose, the DOE um, has um, created a public-private partnership with more than 45 partners currently, and the mission is to address the hurdles to um, establishing a hydrogen fueling, fueling infrastructure and enabling the large-scale adoption of fuel cell electric vehicles. It's structured around four working groups, coordinated by an operations steering committee, and one of the things that we've, uh, the DOE has done is it has a new project with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Sandia National Laboratory, H2 First, with a respective coordination panel looking at the technical challenges associated with putting uh, stations into, uh, hydrogen stations into place. Outreach is a, another important uh, aspect of our work and education. One example of that is an online portal that we have, Hydrogen Tools, which has actual resources looking at um, training, first responders, fire departments, which you can see with the little red dots on the map of the United States here. It includes resources on, as I mentioned, safety, uh, best practices around that, uh, includes first responder training, and hydrogen codes and standards. So this is a site that has more than 1,700 uh, citations. It's being uh, tracked and um, resources are downloaded, not only in the United States, but um, overseas as well, including Europe and Japan. And actually more than half of the, around half of those visits are international visits. There's also international collaboration. And since this is an international forum, I would like to touch upon that a bit and includes the uh, IPHC, which is the International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy. Its mission is to share policy information on hydrogen and fuel cells, so it's not so on the R&D side, it's more on the policy side, and to increase, obviously, international collaboration, share information and lessons learned in the field. We've had a uh, previous meeting in Grenoble, France, and a new one May 20th, in the week, um, actually, and then the same week of the meeting, the Friday of that week, there is uh, a workshop in California. And IPHC concerns um, the whole international community and comprises of 18 members worldwide. So this is the last slide of my presentation. Going forward, we um, have our activities, which we are going to focus on, both on the applied R&D side, on the cross-cutting activities, looking at both technical and um, other challenges associated with deploying fuel cells and hydrogen. 
We have more than 100 publications per year, or approximately around there at least. Uh, there are various events. We have investor days, congressional caucus events, ride and drive, and this is one where the secretary of the Department of Energy, Secretary Muniz, uh, was able to and uh, available to drive the Mirai. Also, we have our annual merit review uh, this year. It's again, it's in June 6 to uh, 10, and in June 2015, we had more than 1,800 attendees. Last but not least, I want to mention that this is the first year the U.S. Um, actually put in place a celebration of hydrogen and fuel cells, and appropriately so, October 10th was chosen, reason being 1.008 is the atomic mass for hydrogen. And with that, I would like to thank you, and if you have any questions, I can answer them here. I'm going to be available and around for the next couple of days, so Either you can talk to me or my uh, director of fuel technology office, Dr. Sunil Sachipal, and our addresses, email addresses are on the slide here. With that, again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitrios, for giving us an overview on how the USA is doing their research on fuel cells. Are there any questions from the audience at this time? I've been waiting all time to ask one question. So my question is on, maybe you can give a personal impression on, if you compare Germany, how Germany is doing research on fuel cells and the US, do you see that there's international competition? Are there markets, is it the US market or the German market? Or do you feel like there's one whole thing that we are all working on to improve? I would say in one, the short answer would be the latter. Um, competition is healthy. Within the United States, there are various companies and stakeholders who are working in the same field for the same application, for instance. But also there's competition internationally. At the same time, I think through my presentation, I mentioned the various collaborative channels that exist, either through formal or you know, much more through our informal uh, coordination. So I would say in one statement that the tide can rise all ships. That's a very good answer to this question. And I'm sure there will be way more questions and you will be around uh, to Definitely. answer all these questions. It was an honor to have you here. Thank you for giving us an overview. It was really nice to have you here as a partner country. So once again, big hands, please. Thank you. Our next presentation will be starting in only two minutes time. And for that, we'll uh, discuss how we can improve solid oxide fuel cells performances. And for that, we'll hear the representative of Serpotec, the general manager, will be speaking. <laughs>